It's a pleasure to see all of you in person and to be with you here um, at uh, this uh, marvelous campus, which we got to see a little bit more of today. And um, I'm happy to welcome you to the History of Economic Society conference. We are starting with, there we go, thank you. We're starting with a, uh, uh, a reminiscence, a set of reminiscences about Jeff Harcourt. And um, starting us off will be Mauro pointing us. And, uh, and then we'll have some shorter reminiscences that, uh, that we're just taking an hour, um, but uh, remembering a important, for many of us, an important um, member of our community um, uh, who died in the last year. So I look uh, forward to this and I'll just give it to them because they're the ones who need to talk. So Mauro, you're, you're on. Thank you, Ross. Uh, could you please put my own my sli first slide on, Marianne? Okay. So, yeah. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ross, Emmett, and Marianne Johnson for putting together this this session. Uh, this started when I submitted a paper about uh, uh, Jeff Harcourt for to a regular session, regular submission. And then uh, most kindly, uh, Marianne and Ross decided to, to, to use my paper as a starting point for a special session in remembrance of, of Jeff uh, Harcourt. And uh, well, I thought that was a brilliant idea. And here we are. Uh, well, th this paper, it started as a, a request from a commission from Nicola Giocoli, who is, uh, who is uh, the editor of History of Economic Ideas, a well-known uh, 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 journal in our field. And, uh, and the paper will come out in, in, in that journal, in History of Economic Ideas, uh, in a few weeks' time. And uh, so uh, I, I must thank as well Nicola Giocoli for, for asking me to do this and for trusting me to, to, to write a, 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 bio, a biographical essay about, uh, about, about Jeff. And for those who are not familiar with this expression down under, that's how Australians refer to their own country, to Australia, because of course, Australia is very deep in the South. So that's, uh, uh, that goes uh, together with the usual uh, good humor of Australians, especially regarding their, their own wonderful country. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, here you have a picture of Jeff uh, is smiling as usual with his blue eyes and very bright. And uh, well, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the first section of my paper, I don't have much time is, uh, is studying Jeff. Uh, uh, and what I, I want to call your attention here is to the fact that uh, Jeff, who, who passed away in December last, uh, last year, 2021, uh, I want to discuss his uh, contributions here from a double perspective. First, as a historian of uh, uh, economic thought, and then as a subject matter for us historians of economic thought. And uh, since this is a session as part of a, a conference of the AGS, I think his, this double perspective is, is quite, uh, quite relevant. And he was a distinguished fellow of the AGS, of the ESHET, of the History of Economic Society of Australia, of course, for his many contributions to, 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 to our field. But as an economist, uh, uh, his international reputation, as most of you uh, are aware of, it came especially after his uh, famous uh, serve in the Journal of Economic Literature about the Cambridge controversies in the tier of capital, uh, which was then published in, in book form uh, three years later. And this year, I think uh, 
probably this month in June now, uh, the 50th uh, anniversary edition of that classic book is coming out with the new preface and two afterwards. Uh, next, please. So from, the, from our point of view, I mean, as a historian of economics, uh, uh, Jeff played a very important role in the emergency of heterodox economics in the 1970s, and especially its post-Canadian alternative. He was a leading uh, post-Canadian economist, and it's important to, to, to point out that heterodox economics started uh, 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 such uh, uh, at an institutional level in the 1970s. Before that, uh, 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 economics was uh, very much pluralist, but after the 1970s, this division between orthodox and heterodox economics became uh, uh, very much clear. From that point of view, it's interesting to, 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 to call attention to the fact that the Cambridge Capital debates were one of the very last conversations between orthodox and heterodox economists. It lasted for nearly 20 years. And uh, some, uh, well, there were often problems of communication in that conversation. And Jeff played uh, uh, an important role in sorting out to those uh, communication problems and defining the terms of this uh, uh, problematic uh, conversation, but a conversation nevertheless. His uh, lifetime was divided between Australia and Cambridge in UK. He was born in Melbourne in, mm -hmm in 1931, and uh, he lived there until 1955 and he studied at the Melbourne University. Um, and then in the, another Australian city where he, be, uh, he lectured and became a uh, full professor for most of the 1960s and 70s. And, uh, and then he came back to Australia uh, 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 after uh, departing from Cambridge in 2010 to Sydney and, and live there until 2021. And in Cambridge, he did his PhD from 1955 to, to 58. And then he came back in, from 1963 to 66, which he regarded as the happiest, happiest period of his life together with uh, his uh, wife, Joan. And it was a very productive period uh, when he wrote lots of uh, important, interesting papers. And then he came back for short periods. And, and then finally, for a long stay from 19 to, uh, 1982 to 2010. And uh, he retired in 1998. Uh, I'm proud to say that I was uh, Jeff's uh, graduate student in, in Cambridge in the early 90s. Uh, and he belonged to this uh, 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 brilliant Cambridge class of 1955-58, together with other very important economists, such as Luigi Passinetti, Pierangelo Garagnani, Amartya Sen, Thomas Imacopoulos, and a few others. Next, please. Uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, I mean, uh, uh, Jeff regarded Knut Wicksell, this the well-known famous Swedish economist, as the most lovable of the great economists because of the way Vixel uh, uh, did his economics, paying respect to other people's works and uh, 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 with a, a good degree of self-criticism when he felt that he was wrong. And so Vixel is really the kind of personality that, that most economists admire very much. And uh, I, I want to, 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 to say here that to many, uh, Jeff Harcourt is among the most lovable of the economists who enlightened our trade over the last 60 years or so, because of qualities that are in a way uh, similar to Vixel and a few others uh, 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 that are described uh, here, like his, uh, the way he did the economics, the way he respected uh, uh, other, uh, his fellow economists, his humanitarian and egalitarian values, and the, the very important role he played as a motivator for, for young economists, especially students, a catalyst and a community builder, establishing connections between economies from different uh, streams and especially his, his courtesy for others' ideas and his ability to read uh, others' ideas and to make sense of them and to express fair judgments about them. And uh, he usually stressed that religious beliefs, political values, and ideological standing were connected together. You, 
could not or should not keep them separate from, from one another. And that was came together with his economic views and approaches. So this distinction between positive and normative economics is something that uh, did not work out uh, from, from, from Jeff's perspective. I, I, I recall uh, 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 very, it's very vivid in my, in, my, in my mind, the first day of classes of lectures with, with Jeff in Cambridge, when he, he took about a half an hour or so to describe himself as a person. I mean, where he stood in, in terms of uh, uh, politics, even uh, uh, religion, and of course, his economic views, his ideology. And at first, uh, we, uh, uh, myself and my fellow students, we looked at uh, each other very much surprised. I mean, because we had never seen anything like that before, uh, so, so sincere. And, uh, and then realize that we are, we had before us a, a special person, a different person who we, just a sec. A different kind of person, a, a very special person altogether. Okay, second uh, section of the paper, History of Economics and Economists' Lives. Uh, it's uh, from, from, from the point of view of this conference of uh, uh, history of economics, uh, I want to point out that this period when uh, after Jeff returned to Cambridge in 1982, uh, that was the period uh, uh, when he, he really produced a lot of uh, important material in the field of history of economics. And his main goal was to work on what he called his vital project about the history and achievement of the John Robinson Circle. As will become clear uh, during my presentation, and I think uh, Christina Marcuse will probably uh, mention that as well, John Robinson was absolutely central in, in Jeff's academic uh, uh, trajectory and also in his work as a historian of economics. So he wanted to preserve the Cambridge post canadian tradition. That was a task that uh, uh, he was passionate about, and it was really crucial to his research agenda. And that uh, culminated in two books, one, The Structure of post canadian Economics from the point of view of the Cambridge pioneers in 2006, and an intellectual biography of John Robinson, uh, joined with uh, Brooker, which came out in 2009. So most of his uh, history of thought pieces, they were related to Cambridge, as we could expect. Uh, not just Cambridge uh, of the post Keynes period, but also Marshall, the Marshallian, the Marshallian economies in disputes over the, uh, Marshall's theoretical heritage. Next, please. Uh, so uh, Jeff's approach to history of economics was very much influenced by his curiosity about uh, where do ideas come from? That was his, uh, what uh, he was uh, looking for. So he had this broad interest on how economists' backgrounds and personalities affect their approaches. So he uh, kept together the personalities and uh, the ideas, the theories. The, the people behind uh, the ideas. That what was his, uh, he was looking at. And that comes out very clear in his pioneer essay about the history of modern economics from the perspective of economic Nobel Prize's winners. Uh, uh, that is from the late 1960s to early 1980s. And mind you, this is really not about Cambridge per se, but it's much broader than that. So it's not a, uh, a kind of Cambridge uh, history of thought, but he, he went beyond that. And that's, that's uh, one of Jeff's best uh, pieces in, in history of economics. And uh, in, in that article, he mentioned what he, he called his favorite Marshall phrase uh, that uh, Marshall said that uh, when uh, in his inaugural lecture in Cambridge, that he wanted to, to have his students uh, 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 that uh, Cambridge should produce students with cool heads and warm hearts. And uh, uh, Jeff thought that uh, he concluded that most of the economists at the time, they uh, uh, complied, they were 
the, 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 their line of work was uh, uh, consistent with what Marshall said. And Harcourt's or Jeff's own goal was to make the world a better place for ordinary men and women to produce a more just and equitable society. That's a, a goal that uh, he, he stressed uh, over and over again. And it was not at the time in contradiction at all with what uh, these Nobel Prize winners or the main economists, according to Jeff, were up to. But that changed uh, after the 1990s when uh, economics uh, changed. Uh, for the worse, according to, to Jeff, and this uh, uh, concern, uh, the warm hearts were sort of gone uh, for, for some uh, influential economies, uh, uh, at least. So he was, uh, this, this approach that he deployed in, in that Hope article, it's, uh, you can also see that in, in his exercise in oral history. He was a pioneer in using oral history and uh, as a building block for uh, writing biographical essays or portraits, as he called them, uh, often informed by, by shots with his subjects. Next, please. So this phrase by Jeff is, 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 is very much is revealing that uh, he believed in heroes and heroines and wanted to, to know what, uh, what was behind their, their economics. But at the same time, the way he used the uh, biographical information was quite selective. I mean, he was uh, very much concerned with private lives. He wanted to keep private lives out of his biographical accounts. Uh, and, uh, and his uh, uh, collection published in 1993 had the same title uh, as his in biography as Keynes' famous uh, collection published 60 years before that. And although there are several points uh, in common between the two books, there are also several differences in, in terms of the way they use the psychological insights in order to discuss the personalities of their subjects. Uh, Jeff's uh, first uh, uh, essay uh, uh, with uh, uh, about uh, uh, John Robinson's uh, trajectory and her intellectual formation that came out in, in the history of economics idea in 2001, where you can find a, a, a clear uh, explanation of the limits of, uh, of, of the, this investigation into the, the, the psychology of, uh, of the economies. It's important, but uh, uh, according to, to, to Jeff Harcourt, we should also be careful about that. At the same time, he was much, very much aware of conflicts and clashes in Cambridge. There were several, some of them witnessed by, by, by Jeff himself. So when he arrived in Cambridge in the 1950s, there was this division between the, the, the Dennis Robertson group and the John Robson and Richard Kahn group. And then there was an internal division between Robson and Caldor, and then later between Frank Hahn and others versus uh, the post keynesian economics, economists, and then the Israfian versus Robinsonians. Jeff was very much part of that, uh, that clash uh, in the 1970s until the 1990s. And uh, according to Jeff, these conflicts went back to Marshall time. I mean, uh, that had been uh, a feature of, uh, of Cambridge uh, economics and Cambridge academic politics, better put, since Marshall. Uh, unfortunately, but that was something that he acknowledged. Uh, next one, please. Uh, I, I'd like to point out that uh, uh, the kind of history of thought that uh, Jeff Harcourt did, although he admired much of Cambridge economics, that does not mean that he was an uncritical historian that uh, only wanted to validate Cambridge economics and heterodox economics. There is much more to his uh, history of economics than that, as I tried to document in my paper. And regarding his autobiographical pieces, he wrote uh, 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 a good number of them, because every time he was uh, requested to do that, people asked them, he, he, he replied positively. So you find lots of uh, very valuable background information about his, his family and uh, the way he came to adopt his religious beliefs. He defined himself eventually as a Jewish Methodist because he, uh, uh, he, 
he had a, a, originally his family, uh, his parents were from a, a Jewish origin, but then he did not have he really had at home a, 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 a Jewish kind of uh, upbringing. So later on, he became a Methodist, and uh, uh, and that uh, uh, he converted to Methodism, and that played a role together with his political view. So like some other economists, like. Uh, and his political views were mainly uh, along the lines of democratic socialism. Uh, next one, please. So now to the capital debates. That was the turning point in, in, in Jeff's career. Uh, and it's interesting to notice that this came by accident. Uh, uh, Mark Perlman, uh, he was the founding editor of the Journal of Economic Literature, he was visiting Australia in 1968, as he did regularly. And then uh, he, he, he asked, when he, uh, by chance, he asked Jeff to, to write uh, a, a, an article for that journal about Joe Robson's complaint concerning capital theory. Uh, and why was that? Because uh, Perman knew about Harcourt's unusual ability in getting each side's position in economic debates in a very straight and sympathetic way. But Jeff did more than that. And uh, uh, he reported as a, a war correspondent, we could say, rather than a combatant, in the sense that he tried to keep some sort of neutrality, despite the fact that he was uh, a Cambridge man, a Cambridge economist, but, but he tried and uh, he succeeded uh, to a large extent in, in that endeavor. Next one, please. So the, 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 that survey clarified the terms of the debate. That debate was a, a crucial, a key debate because it really uh, concerned essential uh, characteristics, essential aspects of uh, uh, neoclassical economics versus uh, at the time Cambridge or post Keynesian economics. So reswitch and capital reversal phenomenon that led to the conclusion that the K, the capital the, of the production function could only be used if there is just a single homogeneous capital good. But the fact is that despite acknowledging that, mainstream economists did not accept the implications of those results for, for their, their broad uh, theoretical framework. Uh, Jeff uh, uh, ascribed that to, to this ideological aspect that the debate was really about the meaning of capital, uh, not, uh, really just to this more technical or formal aspects. Uh, it's interesting to notice that uh, Harcourt had not written about capital theoretical debates before, which by the way, is probably one of the reasons why uh, Mark Perlman picked him to, to, to do it, uh, uh, to do the, the survey. Nevertheless, uh, conceptual and measurement problems, you could find that uh, quite often in his other works, like his PhD thesis, his Cambridge PhD thesis, uh, in, in, in a few papers, and in this collection of essays he, he edited together with Parker, another Australian economist, readings in the concept and measurement of, of income. Uh, next one, please. In that sense, it's interesting that that reflects the accounting foundations of the study of economics in Australia at the time there was, and maybe there still is <laughs> a general concern about uh, uh, this realistic accounting foundations. And that the paper, uh, Jeff's paper that uh, best expressed that is uh, his paper in the Oxford Economic Papers, the accounted in a golden age which is his best known paper next to the, the survey published in the GEL. Up to the 1960s, his, uh, up to the GEL survey, I mean, during the 1960s, uh, his agenda was very much dominated by practical and policy-oriented uh, material together with these accounting foundations of economics. But there were some important exceptions to that. The one uh, that we should notice is he joined to work with an Italian economist, Vincent Massaro, uh, in, in 1964 about uh, Israfa's uh, famous 1960 book. Uh, um, and uh, in 1965, Jeff was in Cambridge 
uh, as a lecturer. And then uh, when uh, he came across, it was the first in Cambridge to come across this paper by David Levar in the Quarter Journal of Economics, claiming that the risk switching was impossible at the aggregate level. And, uh, and then he showed that to Zrafa, and Zrafa said to him, well, you show him, you show that Levar is wrong. But Jeff uh, felt that was not up to his abilities, mathematical abilities, and then he didn't, not, he didn't do that. So uh, uh, that's why he wrote that he, he missed his moment of glory. Passinet eventually did it. So Jeff, uh, uh, he, he, he knew the, the, the importance of mathematics and the role, but at the same time that uh, he, he was also aware that he did not a comparative, he did not have a comparative advantage in that, although he, he wrote several papers that were uh, structured uh, 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 around a, a kind of mathematical argument. Next one, please. Mara. I, Mara. I am closing to, I'm close to finish. Yeah, we've got a couple minutes. So. Yeah, let's go to do section four and then I, I'll finish there okay. very, very quickly. So just, just uh, two minutes to finish. So uh, uh, this distinction between critical and positive tax for him is very important. And, uh, and we also should also notice that uh, 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 even among post canadian economists, American post canadian economists, they were a bit skeptical about the, 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 the role of, of the capital debate in the process of uh, constructing their own theories, which for Harcourt had to do with the fact that they did not deploy the notion of economic surplus as a central concept uh, uh, in contrast with his own framework. Next one, please. But at the same time, he was not as rough an economist because he focused on historical time along John Robinson's line. And micro foundations uh, was uh, always his most sustained interest, including when, uh, when he shared a, a conference for the International Economic uh, Association. Next one, please. So uh, according to, to, to Jeff, post Canadian economics was divided into three streams and his favorite one was the Robinsonian Kaleskian one. So next to John Robson, Kaleskian was the economist that he's most ad, uh, admired. And that was reflected as well in his 1965 paper in the economic record, which uh, 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 was his favorite paper, a very uh, ambitious paper that uh, uh, was not as successful as, as Jeff expected, in part because he, it lacked the formal representation of the process of cyclical growth a la Richard Goodwin. Next one, please. So uh, here I have something about uh, Jeff's uh, concern with the end of the Cambridge tradition, uh, the Cambridge post canadian tradition, the reasons for that, and that has to do with conflicts over academic power. And also the importance of his 2006 book, which incorporated several of the models that uh, Harcourt uh, had uh, put together in the 1960s and in the 1970s, including his paper with Peter Kenyon about uh, price and investment decisions and the markup. Uh, I think now is the last one. But despite these uh, uh, problems and, the, 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 and, the, and the, his sadness with uh, a certain uh, downfall of, of post Canadian economics in Cambridge, he remained very much an optimistic and, uh, and, uh, and he felt uh, a, a very lucky, a fortunate person for being part of, of that tradition and for adding some Australian uh, elements to that, in part also because his, the Department of Economics where he was raised in Melbourne had strong Cambridge connections as well. So in the end, that, that long quotation is from uh, what uh, Harcourt said that at Jesus College in, in uh, just uh, around the time when he retired, which I believe it conveys uh, his frame of mind and how he felt really about his trajectory as a Cambridge economist from down under. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we now are going to have uh, three uh, short reminiscences of Jeff. 
And uh, do you guys want to just come up? Uh, can you, uh, Marianne? You should probably tell Moro that there's a lot more people here than it looks like. Oh, oh yeah, Marianne, can you? Mara, sorry, the, uh, you all you're the seeing is the front of the room. They're all every, everybody, as is common in all of my classes. <laughs> um, all of my classes, the students in the back, and uh, so you have a whole bunch of people behind behind the people you can see. Um, so uh, just so you know that uh, there actually are people in the room. Um, so. <clears throat> Do you want, do you guys want to come sit up here? Let Marie, let Christina make a Okay, just individual. Oh, because you have slides too. Yeah, she had slides. Yeah. Is that a presentation mode? Because there is something. Down at the bar, yeah, yeah, you, uh, you, to, you've moved it. You have to take this out. I can do it, I can. You can do it? Yeah. Well, I'll just. Okay, well, um, Ross helped me with the fine. I, I, I decided in the end that uh, rather than reminiscences, uh, I would try to do something to explain what it meant uh, to be a Cambridge economist. And so I, I will be following very closely. Um, can you find it? Okay. Okay, but before I start uh, doing that, uh, the, the kind of reminiscence I want to share with you is that when, uh, to show how generous uh, Jeff was, I was not a student of Jeff, I met him early in my career and he was extremely supportive and helpful as he was with, with many, many people around him who went to, to see him, to meet him, but I just want to to share with you um, what he did for me at the, early, at the beginning of my career, when John Robinson died in 1983, he went to his uh, to her house to clear some papers and and came with a box and uh, he met me and he said, "I think you will do a better job than I can do with these papers." So he handed over to me. And so he gave me a start in this, my work on Joe Robinson, out of complete generosity. And, um, and this is was Jeff. So what I decided to do uh, uh, today is just to, to give a sense of, of what was for, no, I think this is yours, yeah. um, to be a Cambridge economist. What does it mean exactly and how did Jeff interpret it. So I will start by uh, by quoting from Pasinetti book, in which he held that Joe Robinson, Richard Kahn, Kikar, and Piros Rafa formed a powerful school on the track of Keynes' economic theory. And why he recognized that in reality the school was a group of, of, of people in which the strong intellectual and emotional links did not have uh, less uh, influence than differences in their culture, attitude, and political views, Pasinetti nevertheless held that there was something much deeper that shaped their intellectual affinities for a trapping mess, and that at the same time gave rise to their strong and stormy personal relationship. Uh, that something much deeper he held, lay in sharing a common approach to economics. So, Poti Pazinetti was were very close to, to, uh, to Jeff and following what just Marco said, belonged to the same generation of, of people that, uh, that were in Cambridge at the time. So, I think that Jeff's approach is very similar to Pazinetti in that respect. In seeing Kant, Carlo, Gaines, Rafael, or Robinson, but even Goodwin, Kaleskin, and even Robertson as sharing the Cambridge uh, identity. And what is this identity about? And I think that this identity stems from motivation, values, lifestyle, work style, we do on the intellectual and academic and personal unconventionality of their life. And Jeff personal life was not unconventional. It did not come from an Alice background. 
as these people did, but he shared the same identity as an economist. An identity which has many dimensions, and it is not to be thought of as void of differences, as I will show. And this is the point of this presentation to show how these differences and how Jeff himself uh, didn't think of them as uh, necessarily uh, people with whom he was in total agreement. I think Mauro made it very clear. But I want to specify a little bit to, to give you a sense what these differences were. So let's start from a common ground. Zarafa, Keynes, Robinson, Gan and Calder were certainly group characterized by personal cohesion and intellectual sharing, but also by pervaded differences and divergences in their views. Um, the communication among them, be it in the form of pairwise collaboration of various intellectual achievement, as it was the case uh, between Keynes and Khan, or the Robinson and Khan, or lack of it for the difficulty of communication, as was the case of Rafa, uh, was, mar was marked by personal vicinity and affection in the midst of sometimes very heated controversy. So this, I think, characterized uh, this particular group. But apart, which were exactly these differences and communalities when we come, when we go beyond the personal and intellectual connection? And so I think that uh, to simplify matter, which obviously is always uh, risky because uh, you lose the, um, the depth and the, the the possibility of seeing things in a, in a much better focus, but just to simplify matters, I simplify the story by showing where the divergences were, where were the differences, and where were the communalities. Okay, this is a very simplified and sketchy just to say within the 15 minutes uh, time. Jeff had his own personal position on these issues that we will see, but he never ceased to see them as part of an intellectual and personal effort to understand the nature of the capitalist system and to contribute to overcome its failure. And I think that, that uh, Mauro did very well put in Marshall um, in our lecture, and, and then perhaps he could have others with Austin uh, Robinson said at one point, we were all good doers, we wanted to do good. Um, this, this, this idea that uh, economics was about uh, trying to solve uh, failures uh, within the capitalist system. And I think that Jeff got in this as very clear um, in, in his approach. So uh, again, uh, as you can see, I'm fully agreement with Mauro, which is not surprising. Um, I think Marshall was very important in this tradition uh, because be it in the form of criticism of, or of refinement or of extension, Marshall was taken by this group as a point of reference. Um, and both Keynes and Rafa explored the shortcoming of both the trust in market and the faith in market theory, which inherited my mother by Marshall, of course, in a different way, the way in which they tackled Marshall was different in the case of Keynes and Rafa, but they had in common the same purpose. As we all know, Rafa point uh, was that Marshall inconsistencies arise from his method of representing the equilibrating forces of the market with the crisis mechanism of goods and factor of production, based on marginal magnitudes. Uh, Keynes' uh, attack on Marshall was uh, based on a different ground. It was the uh, idea there was inconsistency in Marshall approach in assuming that there was a tendency to full employment and uh, um, the idea that you can extend to the aggregate to what it is true for the single uh, entity being market or, or Firm. Uh, in printing, while the printing in, in Keynes and, and Zappa was certainly Marshall, 
Cain's rough and greedy was a danger of Sabitado. Cain helped, as we all know, Cain's uh, in fortune the multiplier, the aggregate supply function, supported the scheme to intervene in the market in the public interest. He liked to call himself as the pupil of Keynes to the end of his life. And he was absolutely, to my mind, the, the, the true torture order of, of, of the Keynes tradition in Cambridge. John Robinson was fierce Keynesian throughout the life, but she was convinced more than Kant and Caldo by Zrafa's argument in favor of the classical and especially mass political economy. So that was a different, even Kant and, and Robinson was very close on their attitude towards Rafa, Marx, and political economy, they were quite different. And then, of course, Caldo was modern and theory of distribution, making the leading figure in both for Cambridge, but again, taking on, on a track that Robinson and Kahn did not follow uh, entirely. But then Kahn and Caldo joined forces in finding monetary economy structure in the late 70s. So where this where are the divergences? So let's start with, with Keynes' approach. If, if one has to summarize, what, what, what is the Keynes approach when it comes to the method which we lead to the great Cambridge tradition? Well, I would say that uh, it is an approach to human behavior which rests on two pillars, convention and expectation supported by the notion of probability, probability to be evaluated as a logical proposition, uh, not as a frequency uh, uh, outcome, uh, to be evaluated with evidence and judgment as a guide to action. Okay? It's, a, it's a way of seeing human behavior in a very complex and articulated way. And then there is the idea that the opinion are formed, the way in which a, a opinion are formed is instrumental to transforming them, in particular to the effects of persuasion and institution, with the, again, the ultimate idea of the Marshallian trait, the ultimate aim of attaining the common good. So, I mean, if you, if you want to summarize what his idea about economic policy was, I, I would say that the idea is that um, economic policy has the purpose of managing rather than transmuting human nature. And in the general theory concluded, um, just to make clear that he was not in favor of having the state and the government all over the place, he said it is wise and prudent statementship to allow, to allow the game, market game, to be played, subject to rules and limitation. So it was in favor of markets as long as they were um, uh, corrected in a way in their favor by the limitation. So Rafa was different. Um, he set up a model in which he wanted to represent the working of the productive system. And uh, without saying very little about institutional aspects, uh, and concentrate his attention on the generation and distribution of servers. But the main point being that distribution is determined outside the system of production and is influenced by other economic, political, and social causes. The difference. The divergent, the important divergent between Zrafa and Keynes, and Zrafa did not allow marginal magnitude to enter into the analysis, and prices can be determined without having any recourse to it. While, as we know, Keynes accepted the classical postulate based on marginal analysis. So there was a gulf in the Keynesian and the Zrafa tradition, and I'm sure that. Uh, when uh, even Keynes was dead, when the production of commodity came out, uh, I think that he could have never endorsed it. So much how much he, he uh, 
was uh, an admirer of Zerapa intellectual quality, he did not endorse uh, the project. And on the other hand, I think that Zerapa was, as John Robinson said, secretly skeptical of the idea. And he isolated himself from the Keynesian revolution and alas, the priority from his own contribution. So the critique that Keynes, Kant, Calder, and Jerome so raised against the neoclassical paradigm went together with their apparently unquestioning acceptance of marginal analysis. And so notwithstanding the Keynesian revolution, Cambridge remained machine and therefore far away from Zarafa's background and frame of mind. And even I think that uh, John Robinson would try very desperately to incorporate Zarafa within the Keynesian tradition uh, and was more willing to enlarge the economic approach beyond the boundaries of Keynesian economic. I think she did not understand fully Zarafa's point. Um, he, she interpreted a sentence which we can find in Introduction to Ricardo Principle, uh, where an apparent change in the quantity of output will be distributed whenever there is a change in its value to a change either in which is imperfect. She interpreted this as the impossibility of comparing two different aggregates of commodities at two different points in time because of the impossibility of singling out the effect of a change in distribution. And I think that Jeff sided with Robinson on the issues of logical versus historical time, although he may have not, I'm oh, sorry, shared an interpretation of, of Zraf. So, where are the communalities? We've seen the differences, we've seen the divergences. So, is there any communality? Well, I think that money might be one way in which you put together all these people, uh, in particular Zerafa and Keynes, rate of interest is a monetary phenomena ruled by institutional conventional factor. Um, can quantity of money necessary to bring about the fall in the rate of interest varies with the circumstances and the same uh, responsiveness of the market. Cardor, Quantity of money in a credit economy comes into existence as a result of unplanning. And Zrafa shared, this is my last slide, next one, shared the idea of the rate of interest and monetary agri conventional phenomena. But what I think is more important in this community is method. And I'd like to finish with these two quotations. Keynes said, we cannot hope to make completely accurate generalization because the economic system is not ruled by natural forces. The task of economics is rather to select those variables which can be deliberately controlled and managed by central authority in the kind of system in which we have to live. As Rafa said, I have no intention to put forward another mechanical theory which, in one form or another, states again the income distribution is determined by natural or technical or even accidental circumstances, which in any case are such that they make any action taken by either part in order to modify futile. I do not see any difficulty in the determination of the rate of profit through a control or conventional interest rate, provided that the rate of profit will not be assumed to be determined by external unchangeable circumstances. So it's the political space which is opened up by this two approach, and I think this is what is the method. So to finish, what are the communalities? What's this Cambridge approach about? I think it's the rejection of the classical conclusion that market forces are always at work to bring the economic system to full employment resources. Market, taken as synonymous of supply and demand, is a misleading arena for representation of the rules of production and distribution. But Cambridge is not a self contained theoretical apparatus. Is a set of building blocks which have validity with their own separate domain. Price and distribution, effective demand, monetary theory. Jeff was an eminent scholar in this tradition and rightly proud to be so. Thank you very much. John, I believe you're up. Yeah, quick. Should I use yours? Oh, sure. You can use that. Okay. 
This works. This works. So unlike uh, Christina and, and Mauro, I'm going to keep this uh, completely personal. Uh, uh, Jeff was my supervisor and I met him in uh, 1988. And I had come from UC Berkeley, which Christina had been visiting and gave me a little push towards the history of thought. But I came into Jeff's office in 1988, very much wanting to do the thesis that I had in mind. And um, he was uh, at the same time, wonderfully supportive and completely laissez-faire. And I think you really had to be quite a radical academic to be so laissez-faire with a, a student writing a thesis. So he would let me make my chapters, he would make corrections, suggestions, but I would meet with him in his office with Joan Robinson, of course, on the wall in a nice big photograph. And he never pushed me to read the 1930s material. I was in Smith, Ricardo, these things, and there was no problem. There was no pushing in any particular direction that way. And I know that he was very different with Mauro. Mauro was talking with him about Excel and how to use archives and very, very intensive. But you see, at that time, when I met him, Jeff was already more than 10 years into biography. So now I realize I step into his office and he takes my temperature very quickly, you know? Who is this person? You know, what does this person want? And so he knew what I wanted and he gave me this tremendous space and feeling of freedom. So, so, so he's different supervisor for different people and he has some radical ability to be laissez-faire with a student, which would terrify, I think, most supervisors, you know? The second thing I wanted to say about him is that, you know, the moment you met him as an American, the Australian accent just hit you in the face, you know, bam! And, and the occasional salty word would come out, you know, in that Australian down under kind of way. And, um, that aspect, Malmo referred to how he was willing to talk for half an hour at the beginning of his lectures about his personal views and his religious uh, uh, thinking and so forth. This, you knew that this was a person so comfortable in his own skin that you didn't have to be worried about him feeling pressured in any way about how you should write, how he should behave. So that kind of confidence really was, was very, very important. And in fact, I wound up, uh, responding to an ad for a post Keynesian economist. And that's the job I've had now for more than 30 years. And in fact, I know very little post Keynesian economics. And I had Jeff Harcourt as my supervisor. So there, you know, he's really is quite, quite, quite radically laissez-faire in, in that way, right? And never said anything to me about what I should know about. It. So, 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 so thanks to, thanks to Jeff's liberality. Thank you, John. Um, well, I was also Jeff's PhD student. I'll try to be very brief because we're, we're over time. And there's also the problem of decreasing returns after hearing Christina, Mauro, and John. There's very little I can add, I think. Um, but I wanted to read a statement, if I may, from Jeff's family who had the memorial last Saturday and asked me to read these words of thanks to the society from them. Jeff would have been so honored to be remembered in this opening session of the History of Economic Society. We wanted to say thank you for all the many kind messages about Jeff. Knowing he was so loved by many has greatly helped us in this time of loss and grief. His care and generosity of spirit shines through as well as his legacy of social justice for humanity. The conversations and tributes confirm how much he cared for his colleagues students and friends. The many stories from around the world reflect not only his great love for people, but also his passion and hopes for the future. Um, and this is signed by Joan, um, his wife and family. And of course, he survived by his four kids and his four grandchildren. Um, so that is the message from the family. One or two other things, I think Mauro mentioned it, the 50th anniversary of his book is out. Now, um, it has just been out and it's the two wonderful introductions by Abby Cohen and Tiago Mata on the life of a book. Tiago Mata is, is a very interesting chapter and Abby Cohen speaks about the overall effect of Jeff. Um, and I wanted to say something which wasn't covered actually before that a very important part of not only Jeff's life but his work as a teacher was also his wife Joan who helped a lot in dealing with um, 
with students and uh, student communities and they together very importantly created communities around them wherever they went, whether that is in, uh, in, uh, in Cambridge or in Sydney. The rest of the notes I'll leave, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say something briefly, which is from um, something that Jeff wrote in uh, 1980, when he, he wrote that he, he taught for more than 70 years, of course, and one of the classes he, he, he taught, it's on radical, on radical economics. He said, we discussed, for example, Morris Dobbs, political economy and capitalism, and Milton Friedman's capitalism and freedom. I told the students that they could not decide where they stood on how best to approach economic issues and indeed grand societies until they had absorbed the arguments of these two classics. And I think this shows the very open nature that Jeff took on these subjects. And I think this carried to the end. I was his PhD student in early 2000 when he had already retired, but he accepted to take me as a PhD student. And one of my memories was coming out of the first meeting we had and meeting the other PhD students in the department. And I discussed with another one and I said, what did your supervisor say? He said, please read four papers from the latest journals, decide on one, and I want the paper by the end of the year. Well, he, I said, my, my supervisor, Jeff, asked me to read Excel Marshall and another of others before I start doing anything. Um, and of course, these were very different experiences. We shaped us. And I think if there is, and both Mauro and Christina spoke about the intricacies of the Cambridge, um, of the Cambridge economists and their differences. But I think if there is a reason that these kind of internal affairs are still of interest to us or seem to be of interest to us to continue to engage with them is for me that these economists remained, and Harco was a very good example of this, interested and vested in having a very broad understanding of the capitalist system and revisited this in a way, and being generalists about this, in a way that I think many economists of the generations that followed them of traditions, of different traditions did not engage in. And I think this has a resonance of some kind. And this resonance is what I think keeps us interested um, and will hopefully keep us interested in Jeff's work and the work of the other economists around. But I think it is what Cambridge economists, uh, what historians of economic thought are very much interested in. One last observation is that um, Jeff, as it was mentioned before, um, was one of the last of the generation of economists who knew another economics than it is today, in the sense that he was there when, uh, when Aro spoke of his first paper on Medicare um, in, in the 60s. Now it's a whole field. Um, so the, the, the vision of economics is entirely different for us to appreciate today. And of course, um, this sort of marks historical time within the history of ideas in a very different way. I was reading somewhere that Robbins asked his PhD students in the 30s to read what there was in the library in the LSE, which was half a shelf. Um, and from there, you know, Jeff asked me to read that particular half a shelf. And now, of course, the, uh, the perspective of the economist, but also the specialization has significantly changed. So visiting again, I think these, these lives has importance because we see in itself and through the many contributions of Jeff who spanned from the fifties until who, you know, from 55, when he came to Cambridge by taking a boat from Sydney that took two months to get there, all the way to today, I came over nine hours from London, um, how much, well, the profession changed and historical time has changed, which phrases, of which frames the very ideas. But thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you all for joining us and uh, for a, a, a uh, somber but yes also uh, quite enjoyable and at moments uh, even 
of the humor of, of life and the, and the details of life that uh, that was wonderful to hear. Um, we have a reception outside, so um, you we can simply move right out the door. And I look forward to uh, conversing with you out there. So thank you very much to our speakers.